Well, hello, creatives, community, and kind folks. Welcome to RPG with DBG. Um, although there's no need to welcome you because all of you are the co-hosts on this channel as we talk all things tabletop role-playing games live over on Twitch, YouTube, uh, Discord, Facebook, and all that sort of thing. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, I really appreciate you guys helping me co-host the show. Now, of course, I have to give you uh, the parameters, the preamble for the show. Uh, we're slightly deviating from, we, from what we normally do, and we're going to do another world-building bu series. Now, in the past, those who understand, or matter of fact, if you don't um recognize this you can go back in the archives but we often take things from our classic role-playing games uh, basically dungeons and dragons and we like the world build and that's where we kind of deviate so we did a whole world building series on every single character class like what if the world was changed shifted manipulated by those particular character classes we did the same thing with monsters where uh, a particular class of monsters in our classic dungeons and dragons had kind of dominated the world. And this time around, something else unrelated to what we were going to talk about, which is are the schools of magic, is a, a, a new full trailer for a movie about to be released. Uh, June 30th is The Green Knight. And there's a story about The Green Knight. Of course, you can look it up. It's about this young knight, part of the, the Knights of the Round Table, has, is challenged by the Green Knight who comes in and, um, and makes a challenge that, that uh, someone can strike him with his axe. And in a year and a day, he will return and strike that person back with with that very axe and if they were to uh to survive such a thing that he would give them uh, his axe it's a weird story and it, it and it's a tale of it's very fantastical um and uh deadly even and strange and it it's a lesson about honor and duty and being a, a knight from the round table well it made me think about in a lot of these stories, whether they're stories about Greeks and Roman gods or stories about uh, Knights of the Round Table, I even went down a deep dive in listening to uh, African uh, uh, stories about um, Anansi, uh, an, an African spider-human hybrid story where Anansi's always getting in trouble and there are stories to – essentially, there these are stories to tell children – about making mistakes and navigating the world and doing the right thing. And a lot of these stories are, of course, they're life lessons and they're protect, to protect children and to teach people the rights and wrongs of the world. But within the context of the stories, those powers, um, sorry, those concepts are powers unto themselves that duty and honor and justice are just as powerful and physical as gravity and light and weather. So it made me think about the this power of sorts, this thing that you, you can't manipulate, but it's out there, made me think about the schools of magic. And so I thought, well, let's world build off the various schools of magic. This The first school of magic being abjuration. So the under the school of of uh, abjuration, it's oh I didn't I didn't even call it up. Uh, under um, abjuration magic, it is defined as the school of magic encompassed by protective spells. They create physical or magical barriers, negated magical or physical abilities, harmed trespassers, or even banish the subject of the spell to another plane. Of existence, some abjuration spells include dispel magic and resist energy. And I say, well, what if we just start designing worlds by each school of magic? Now, of course, the the schools of magic aren't actual schools; they're just it, categories of magic. It, and there is even even till today, there's some contention about which spells belong in which category of magic because there's a, a lot of overlap. Um, within the abjuration, the protection, the warding types of spells, some of them create physical barriers, which 
some would say would relate to maybe more of a uh, a conjuration or transformative event. And there's other we'll, we'll get into the other schools of magic as well. Um, in, in terms of like, are you summoning something from somewhere else or are you transmuting something? And so there, there's always been contention. Uh, although I think that more or less falls into the category of game design uh, in, the, in the sense of maybe you want to give more options or try to equalize as many options in the various schools of magic as well. Uh, now, when it comes to protective magics and in a setting, our rule here is when we start to world build that this kind of power is out there. It doesn't necessarily mean you own, there are only wizards with this power, but that the world itself, the, the fundamentals of the world are affected by the powers of abjuration. So the first thing I'm thinking of is that maybe there were, there was, or could even still be um, an ancient civilization where humanity is living amongst maybe the ruins or the, the artifacts of a world in which these objects were, are eternal, like ancient cities that, no one can knock down the castle walls or the defensive measures that they're so ancient and so powerful that no force can, can remove them or take them out. And so I could, could imagine this, you know, uh, walls made of strange marbled glass or, um, you know, even uh, types of empty elven cities made out of, of, uh, spun thread almost in golden light, but that it still is in existence tens of thousands of years later and humanity is living in and amongst what would normally be considered ruins. And, and while human beings might be able to carve up some wood and, and leather and bone and, and, and construct things inside of them that might be temporary in their existence, the walls themselves or the buildings themselves, the roads and whatnot, are, are still around. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, Cam says, a, uh, a wall made of swords. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, in my head, I'm thinking something f absolutely non-standard, right? Like, yeah, we, we've seen images of castles and walls and things, but could you imagine, like, <laughs> uh, I don't know, three miles of, like, a wall made of just a bunch of swords, and everyone's like, well, how did it get there? Who put it there? And did somebody physically walk up there and place a sword to leave it there or something? Or is it, you know, is, is it invulnerable? Like you can't remove it. I'm thinking the latter, like, no, you can't move it. It just, it's just something that exists, you know? And um, it, it may not even be like, it may not be ruins. They, these things might be in existence that look brand new as if it was just created, even though it's been around for a thousand years. And, and some of it might be cast off from maybe like uh, Titans. I'm thinking, I'm thinking Greek and Roman mythological Titans. Like uh, to, to us, uh, it might be a mountain, but to them, it might've been like an old helmet or something, you know, a classic, like, like from the movie 300, a helmet dropped into the sands. But when we look at it, it's like a 10 story building and people are living inside of it, but it's just, it's really like a cast off helmet from like some warrior that was a Titan from long ago or whatever. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking of that in terms of objects that exist in this world. And I could see because of so many protective uh, magics and barriers around that society might be able to thrive a lot longer um, um, to become technologically uh, safer in their technological advancements because it might be easier to hide for society to hide behind whatever barriers there are. So for example, you know, when, when uh, food and shelter and safety are abundant, people are able to have more free time and they don't have to defend themselves as much. So, you know, once, once the city walls close in the city States, people can, you know, delve more into the arts and sciences and, and education and things of that nature. So I think there is a possibility that people might be far more civil in the society, at least when it comes to communication, not saying that people won't be brutal and there won't be individuals murdered all the time, but 
uh, all out war might be I could see might not be the smartest thing anymore that wars tend to be protracted very long and instead uh, interlopers and theft and bribery and assassination and you know get knocking down someone else's city state walls is probably impossible but getting them to open up the doors to allow an interloper inside is probably the best bet so i can see that there would definitely be lots of security measures so uh espionage would probably be a high ranking thing as well meaning like i understand that this like uh i i do have the spells list here um un- under underneath the spells list like wall of force isn't there on the abjuration list which kind of surprises me but i could see like um security being a very high level of intent and player characters needing to convince security guards to let them pass and and having um being able to fool systems to allow them to go into other uh, other well defended regions knowing that their defensive measures could clap down on top of them at any time <laughs> yeah rickard's like uh and dark magic that lets out monsters in the wall in the wall um um, in the people of the city, <laughs> dark mode. You know, um, one of the problems, not it's not a problem. One of the issues with having high security is the the idea that not only does it keep people out, but it keeps you in. And I like the idea of like a city. <laughs> hey, Vince, what's going on? Um, I like the idea of a city of a city that's just as dangerous for from the outside as as the inside, especially. Especially like a a um once the city walls close, that whoever dominates that city becomes the master of that city. Basically, like many dictators that are running around with like I don't know rabbit dogs and hunters or something, and the population has to keep on their p's and q's because once the once the walls close, there's no one, there's nowhere for you to run, which in itself uh, is a great form of of conflict and tension, especially if the, 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 once the sun goes down, the, the walls close up and uh, the PCs are like, we we're, okay, we're just going to have to run and hide as much as possible to get away from the city guards before the walls then open up. And, and the closing and opening of some particular cities might not be by their, their design might, maybe the cities operate on their own. It's like, Nope, we can't open and close the doors. They open and close on their own. <laughs> yeah yeah um for for those who uh what a what a quote from from uh the watchman series right once the walls close you're trapped in here with me that was from rorschach sure shark when he goes to prison and all the all the bad guys he put in prison in, in there and he ends up going to prison and everyone in there is like oh i'm gonna take you out and it was basically rorschach was basically like a, a batman stand in and he was like oh don't think you're tra- i'm trapped in here with you you're trapped in here with me mofos yeah <laughs> yeah i love it i love it oh this is like i got vacation for two weeks sweet Kylie says, um, says um, we're going to need potions of extra small. We want to visit the fabulous hidden city of plus two helmet. <laughs> well, it depends on on what size of, of the uh, hidden, the, uh, the fabulous city of helmet that you go to, right? I mean, it could be an extra large helmet if you got a big old head. <laughs> no, but um, we're, we're talking about world building with schools of magic. And we are starting out with abjuration magic protection magics and we're designing a world in which these powers are the influence of the setting now of course of course we could do the the classic you know spell magic wizards protection um there may even be things um (laughs) um there may even be so many dangers outside that you you kind of need the protections as well. So that's also a possibility that that yeah you got to get in. There might be various cities and even smaller locations are scattered around this setting that you have to scramble to from one place to another to get there. You know, um, so I <laughs> yeah, it's like you could even take your city with you. And, um, with protection magics, maybe, maybe. Why not? Why the hell not? 
<laughs> this, this is on a roll. All right, so uh, Cam mentions that uh, there's an old Canadian joke that ends with the with Quebec having a magic having a wall walled magic wall around it and getting filled with water. Ooh, <laughs> um, that's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> but I but I like it though. <laughs> Just make it a big old bowl. Hell, I, I think Ohio's kind of like that. It's because I, I'm in the Ohio Valley and it floods a lot. Uh, Vince says, "Did you guys talk about the the obvious absorb elements effect for building cities in volcanoes or inside a glacier?" No, we haven't gotten to that level. But yes, being able to build a city where normally you couldn't build one because of protective magics. Hell's yes, and. Uh, mobile cities, cities that disappear, cities that are, I'm thinking defensive magic, cities that you forget exist, um, uh, cities that are like in between worlds and whatnot. I, I, I like that. Dead, oh, yeah, Dead Man's like, uh, Warshark was the equivalent of the question, not Batman. Um, yeah, yeah, but even the question was a, was a form of Batman at back at back in the day because Batman used to wear the fedora hat. In a in a three piece suit and uh, and a cape. If you if you go back uh, to the actual classic versions of them, Batman was a was a noir detective. So I'm I'm talking about that form of Batman, not the not the uh, spandex wearing one. Um, hmm. Rickard says alternatively, City One put up protective barriers surrounding itself against city two c2 responds by putting up another protective shield around city one to keep people of city one inside <laughs> yeah yeah it can work both ways we often don't think about it that way like oh i'm gonna cast a wall of force around myself great okay now you're stuck inside of it <laughs> uh so yeah yeah, they're all the same character. <laughs> yeah, Rickers like, uh, isn't that the Shadow, not the Batman? They were all they were all pulp pulp era characters. The Shadow, the Phantom, the Spider. Um, oh, you could keep going on, and and you could even throw in cer- certain characters like Doc Samson into that group and whatnot. They 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 were pulp action characters back in the day. So so yes, the answer is yes, all of the above. Um, <laughs> oh man Vince is like interestingly being a spellcaster in such a world would totally suck because there would be dispel magic or anti-magic effects everywhere it sure would and I think I'm I'm thinking that it's not that there wouldn't be other spellcasting going on but you would have to navigate the, the pa- you'd have to navigate the fact that you couldn't do it until you were able to either shut it down or mitigate or turn off or time your special abilities between the fact that you couldn't use those abilities at either um, locations, times of day, uh, things like that. Like, yeah, you can cast a fireball, but if the citizens of the city can stand inside of these circles or go inside the walls and your fireball just spates across the outside walls and they're not going to be scared of you, but they maybe they can't leave as well. So I could see there being this, like, there's a constant push and pull of like, okay, we how do we convince the people that are protected to get out of their protective measures? Or how do I get behind, again, getting locked behind the walls, right? Like, how do I get behind the protective measures to do my thing to get them to, you know, be vulnerable to this other magic, you know? And I, I kind of like that. Uh, Gaster says, uh, have to admit, I do not know what abjuration magic is. So, uh, can someone give me a quick summary? Uh, okay. Uh, abjuration school of magic encompasses protective spells is the definition. Uh, they created physical or magical barriers, negated magical or physical abilities, harmed trespassers. That's a, that's an interesting one there. Harm, harming trespassers, or even banish the subject to another plane of existence, such as like, uh, uh, kicking, demons back to their plane of existence or having magics set up when someone tries to break into your home or open up a chest or something like that. So there's like alarm styled magic. Yeah. Um, and uh, like Vince says, an anti-magic field around it to weaken all of the monsters inside. Yes, exactly. Uh, the classic, the classic pentagram with someone inside of it or a monster 
summoned from another plane of existence inside of it is very much a classic image of what abjuration looks like. Uh, let's see if I can uh, bring up a let's bring up a, let's bring up an image here. Um, do I have a spell? Let's see if this works here. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, so um, let's see if, you, if I can give you a larger image of this. Nah, it's not looking too good, but um, there's some abjuration and abjuration magic images here um, of, of people. Normally you see like the pentagramic images of, of spell casters and things like that. So yeah, it's, Essentially, it's the it's the it's the idea that you can have magics and um, stand behind protective barriers and things like that to keep so called enemies and adversaries and evil things outside. Um, Cameron mentions that uh, that yeah, abjuration magic would make for good prisons. Imagine a fantasy Arkham Asylum made with wards and stuff. You know what? I was thinking of that too. Like, <laughs> and, and imagine like there's a there are that for some reason, and I don't know why this would exist, but there's a prison, a magical prison that people have to literally live in. I, I don't know why you would want to, why you would want to live in a prison, but it would be pretty interesting to have things timed that way. And like trying to figure out how to turn on and off the, abjuring magics to free things in and out of the prisons? I don't know. Now, Rickard's, Rickard's talking about like conjuration. For prisons, I go conjuration instead and just put a spell that binds the prisoners to the cells, activating it every 10 seconds to teleport them back into the cells, rubber banding the prisoners every few seconds. For conjuration, yeah, and, and mind you, mind you that there's always overlap with things, right? Like, for example, abjuration magic can kick things back to where it came from uh it technically is that conjuration from the other end going on i don't know um you, you could make that case uh let's see vince uh going back to a comment vince made about this magic wall to keep someone in actually happened in the, in the that time I got reincarnated as a slime anime. <laughs> I never heard of that. The city of the protagonist got attacked by creating anti-monster field. Did not know. <laughs> That's pretty ridiculous, but I love it. I've never heard of that. An anti-magic... Sorry, the last, rest of the comment was an anti-magic field around it tweaking all the monsters inside. I, I never heard of that. I've never heard of that anime. Um, okay, so I think the... So of course, so we have we make our setting, and a couple of the things that we need to create, of course, are uh, challenges and adversaries. So we need challenges and adversaries. Like, wh why? Well, why do they have the this warding magic? How can it be used by our player characters? Of course, now we have to have our player characters, and what do they do in this world? Like, how do they navigate this world, and what kind of adventures can we tell? And I think one of the one of the things is that. The, the player characters, I, I'm imagining if there's so much defensive magic, there must be dangers outside. And I would dare say that the dangers without the protections are something that should overwhelm the player characters and, and the people in this world. Like I'm imagining that, that out outside in the world, whatever beasts or something that are being kept at bay or whatever kinds of undead or spirits or hypnotic powers or whatnot, because a lot of abjuration magic protects the mind as well as the body that, you know, scrambling from one defensive location to another or, or hiding behind your defensive magics is, is quite important because it's far too easy to be overrun. And there might even be, there might even be like, like, par not parasitic monsters, but there might be so many dangers out there that they're feeding upon themselves. Like there's monsters feeding upon monsters, and it's it's like it's like a it, it it's like churning water when you throw chum into the water and you see like lots like sharks or or um, 
barracudas or piranhas just like churning bloody, making the bloody waters and whatnot. I'm just imagining outside these city walls, it, w- it would be like that. And that traveling between them would be very dangerous. And um, I like that. <laughs> uh, I, I like the prison idea too. Um, the Bazaar Bazaar, a garish wind whipped tent set up at a lonely location. Only the market it contains is bigger on the inside. Mind the Rakshasa if you can identify him. Oh, like a like uh, like a traveling like a traveling bazaar, and the only ways to like you you have to know where to find it and where it is because it's like it's well protected. And of course, you can't steal anything, but you're going to have to find out who who runs it. I, I love Rakshasas though. Rakshasas are kind of cool. Although the thing that weirds me out is the I I hate body mods and the fact that they their hands are backwards just makes me uh it rubs me the wrong way um mm, you guys still talk about the prison the prison idea uh cam says some people's lives are so wrecked that the only way they can get three meals a day is to be in prison also there is a culture in there that becomes ingrained in long-term prisoners that is hard to leave leave behind and there's also the yep there's and there's also the business aspect of going to prison and there are um and there's a prisons are a business unto themselves you know so i i could see maybe there are dictatorial leaders that like a prison, if you want to be safe, you could either live out in the wild or you can live in here. But if you live in here, you're basically in prison, right? Like a population that lives in here. It would be kind of weird to, for people to raise their families inside of a prison, but it'd be, but it would be a unique setting, I think. Uh, Ricker says, if you spill the chum on the docks, does that summon boulets? Hey, yeah. Why? Well, uh, since they are technically, I hate the term boule, but whatever. Um, Land sharks, I, I think the, I think a version of them. Of course, you can make the, easily make them aquatic. You just change aquatic, whatever. But something like that in like a desert or something like that would be pretty cool. Deadman says in real life the bizarre bazaar is, is in Richmond. Do you mean Richmond like Virginia? <laughs> um. Uh, no, I, I, I like the idea of like spilling chum and having like, uh, have distracting the things that are outside. Uh, what is it? Um, the movie Dune with the, 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 uh, the sandworms, right? They put out those warbler effect, those rods into the sand to create sound to, to get the sandworms to come up someplace, but it's also a way for you to, the, the, the sound vibrations, you can use the sound vibrations to lead the sandworms in one direction so you're safe to go in another direction and whatnot. Uh, I could see the player characters having to, they are almost like decoy parties out there in the wild. And then every once in a while, they'll have to like turtle up inside of their defensive tiny huts and whatnot out there. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm liking that a lot. As a matter of fact, they might player characters might have to be forward observers on like trade routes or something so that the, they become the dangerous, they become the decoys, the, the, they become the chum in the water in a way so that others can survive or something. I like that. Oh, bullets are crazy um rickard says chum transporting becomes super dangerous if you spill even a little little the boulets can smell it from miles around and come running hells yes there uh i don't think i could find it but there's a really cool image of that happening where uh someone this is a piece of artwork where i saw it. I, I really loved it where there were people living on the tops of of plateaus and mesas and there were there was a cable system running between them and they were dangling meat down and you could see the boules like eating at the meat that was dangling down and the people had to live up on the plateaus and travel from one plateau to another it was very it looked very new mexico arizona ish very dry i don't know who did the artwork but it was really it really had my mind going like that'd be awesome to have to have to adventure like that from jumping from 
from <laughs> thing to thing. Yeah, <laughs> Tremors, here we go. Yeah. Oops, there it is. Yep. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Kylie Kylie brings up the fact that, uh, oh, yeah, Belay's infested dune seas, galleons with big running skis, ooh, and enchanted sails that can gain high speeds from, from the slight breeze. Ooh, and maybe, okay, since we've kind of made this a little bit of a, like a, a high seas kind of thing, but not necessarily water, maybe something happened. Okay, maybe the dust in the air isn't dust at all, but something has been eroding over time. Everything gets eroded, everything. And the dust in the air, the ground itself, um, what we what we would normally consider sand isn't sand at all, but it's like it's bone and rust and everything's destroyed except for the things protected against the destruction of the desolation in the world. So that these uh these city states, the prisons, the the things that we would normally consider to be like, why is it still in existence? are the safe places because what's blowing through the air and the monsters that, that exist in this world um, are, are swimming through this, this uh, desolation of like a dune like planet or something. And maybe the few places where there is growth, uh, living, uh, living growth, humanity has to like move to it to hopefully get it and cultivate it as much as possible before it goes away. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Kylie's like caravan guard duty was never so exciting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not not so boring anymore, right? When you're like, oh my god, oh they're coming after us. All right, that means uh the three of you are gonna have to be our sacrificial lambs, and they're like, no. <laughs> Go out there and dump the chum in the water. I don't know what the chum would be. Maybe they're like um NPCs or something. <laughs> Cameras like Boulets. Time for a circle of protection against fifty-year-old anti-French puns. Yes, yes, that's where the Boulet came from, which is so the the, the name of Boulet came from. Yeah, <laughs> pretty ridiculous, I think, but whatever. <laughs> oh man, now now Vince says, couldn't you make something a bit weird as transportation? In a Numenera game, my GM made a ship that ignores the rotation of the Earth to move itself around. Couldn't Abjuration make something similar? Oh, hell yeah. Why Why not? Ooh, hell, imagine, all right, follow, follow this. Imagine a city-state that is divorced from the physics of the world and the rotation of the Earth, that the city remains stable. The city is doesn't move. But the world revolves around the city. So as the as the terrain moves past the city, it looks like the city's actually sliding, but it's not. It's just there. And maybe it moves through like maybe it doesn't even move in elevation. So there are times where it's floating in the air because the elevation goes down. And then other times it slides through mountains because, well, because <laughs> that would be really bizarre. I like that. <laughs> hey, Mike. Mike Gould's here. Uh, Ricker says, you don't need to outrun the monsters, just need to outrun you. Hell yeah. Hell <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't, what is it? What is, yeah, I don't need to be the fastest. I just need to be faster than you to outrun the monsters and things that are out there. And in a weird way, I think this actually works by having things that player characters can't defeat, right? Like, I understand it, it sounds like an a-hole move to have the players have to fight against wave after wave of, I don't know, boules or chimera or like uh, there's 37 purple worms out there and more coming or something like that, right? Like it sounds pretty ridiculous, but I think in the context of this kind of setting where abjuration magic has shaped the world, I think it kind of fits. It's like, yeah, it, it's, it's the... Um, it's the undead, it's the zombie apocalypse uh, trope, right? One or two zombies, no big deal. Oh, people get better at fighting zombies. 15 zombies, no big deal. But there's always more on the horizon. And they're always, they're always, 
multiplying exponentially if you stay still. And I could see this happening where the player characters are like fighting the monsters that are out there, knowing full well that the longer they stay to fight the few, there's going to be the many behind them and even more behind them. And then, you know, it, you know, it's exponential growth. It's like, yeah, we could take out three or four boulets, but man, there's going to be hundreds of them if we stay still. And then having to like run, dodge, move, lead things away monsters away or something so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah michael's like dear gods a purple worm or boule apocalypse um maybe maybe we are talking about that um i could see that also uh i could there's a lot of paranoia in this world if you're if there's that much defensive magic anti-magic s- spells banishment spells, alarms, and shield spells going up, and and um, abjuration magic everywhere that I could see there being a lot of paranoia and trying to um, socially navigate through other people's paranoia everywhere is also a challenge in and of itself, right? Like, you no, know, it's impossible for a player character to go kill the king because the king is is literally behind like 15 layers of protections of magic, right? But to get there, it, you may need to socially navigate through a world to get somebody to drop their defenses to, you know, trade goods and services, to drop their defenses, to have, to literally have a uh, diplomatic uh, meeting of exchanging of information or something like I could see this being a a weird way of like stepping, stepping past the wall to be blocked by another wall to step even to a third level of security. But you're, but now that you've gone three levels deep into security, you're also three levels um, prevented from being able to leave. If you got to run and having to navigate that, you know, I, I, I like that a lot. Mm-mm-mm. Vincent, uh, Cam says, you know those flying whale things that arm with armor that the Chitari bring in the first Avengers. What about doing that with a purple worm? And <laughs> Vince says, just Googled it. I didn't know they even had a name. Just Googled it. They're called Akanti Space Whales. I never... I didn't even think they even had a name, but yeah, I think doing that with purple worms, like have like they're fl- like like a um, space uh, spell jammer type of thing. Hell yeah! <laughs> Dante's like, did, did someone say space whales? Did not know. Th- why wasn't I notified? Space whales. Mm-hmm. I-, I love it. <laughs> um, ooh. Rickard says, imagine the material cost for spells in such a world. Now, how interesting would that be? Like, for example, maybe the adventure, the player characters need to adventure out for no other reason than to get the material components to even cast the defensive spells in the first place. Like, that becomes an economy unto itself, right? Like, uh, okay, let's see. We got, let me find, let me find a, uh, find a spell here. Uh, what's a, what's a, relatively high level one uh protection from energy what do you need for that protection from energy oh well it's verbal and somatic spell okay maybe not all right how about um i don't know anti-life shell or so nope same thing and it's stone skin okay (laughs) fourth level stone skin material component diamond dust worth 100 gold pieces which the spell consumes Oof, <laughs> I found one. Uh, yeah, getting that 100 gold piece diamond somewhere, you better know where you're going. Oh, man. Rickard mentions private sanctuary spell requires a thin sheet of lead, a piece of opaque glass, a wad of cotton or cloth, and powdered chrys- chrysolite. Something tells me prices for those things would be astronomical. Hells yes. And... And imagine like a security service that does that for other people. Like, oh, you like, like there's, there's actually private security whose only job is to create like um, sanctuary spells around someone or cast defensive spells, spells on them when they travel or um, 
even using other magics like silent spells, uh, things to protect someone's mind so that others aren't stealing their corporate secrets out of their brains and whatnot. Yes, I, I absolutely agree with you. Yep. Spell component, black market. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And even hell, why are you walking around with diamond dust? Because like in the real world, if you're wearing body armor, like <laughs> like Kevlar armor, you're expecting trouble. Why why are you even expecting trouble in the first place? Maybe there are 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 you planning on doing something wrong? <laughs> you know. Mm-mm-mm. Oh man, you guys are so. What is this fling? Attacking with a flame spell? Red card for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It, wow. I mean, I suppose you could even go even sillier and just like someone's like, uh, uh, your average citizen's like, oh, they're casting fireball out in the out in the uh, the streets again, and they just close their doors because they know that like fireball spell can't penetrate their homes. They're just like, ah, damn kids, close, close. <laughs> eh, get off my lawn with your acid sprays and fireballs. <laughs> oh man. Ooh, Vince mentions, I just thought about Magic the Gathering and the tactic that the Azorius deploys where they change the rules in what can and can't be done. So, for example, all spells are more expensive or no counter spells. I, oh, absolutely. I think, I think not just anti-magic, but maybe someone or some places can turn the dials on what is or isn't possible, right? And... Like, for example, in a city of anti-magic, you're in danger if you stand in the one spot where magic can be cast like that. You know, they they herd you into the city square, and that's the city square where where a fireball can be used, right? As um or or something like that. Yep, I I absolutely agree with you there. Oh man. Mm-mm-mm. Getting into the chat again. Uh Dante brings up the fact that I think. The most sense was like a nuclear arms race. I tried to adjudicate it that a higher level spell breaches abjuration. Otherwise, magic breaks too much combat. Um, yeah, there there are issues when you when you start to ramp up the the higher level you go, the game does start to break apart, and even the world starts to unravel itself. Which is why you know the classic Dungeons and Dragons most characters retired between like eighth to 11th level ish and whatnot anything above that you were you're superheroes right and so yeah it does start to break apart which which is kind of which is where we're kind of playing a little bit so it's kind of fun and as a matter of fact i think it'd be kind of cool if the player characters look at a city wall and it's like surrounded by a prismatic wall or something or sphere or something and they know exactly what that spell is knowing that it's working against them that they're not the only uh, the only snowflake, special snowflakes. Yep. Ooh. Mike Gould mentions the teaching of verbal and somatic only spells might be considered illegal without a legal writ. Hmm. Which brings up maybe there are, ooh, punishments. Here's something, a brutal punishment, getting your tongue cut out. Or your hands uh, cut off, right? It's. I mean, we've seen that. We've seen that as a theft deterrent. Yes, like you're saying, like the spells uh, is meant as a uh, as a theft deterrent. Like the cutting out of a tongue or the the cutting off of your hands might be a thing. Or you you can't even speak to a noble unless you've been uh, muffled and your hands bound, right? That might be a, a a cultural norm where you see someone walking with like. Um, a uh, their their hands are self people consciously wrap a, a chain or a cloth or something around their hands or uh, something over their mouth or around their face like a like a, a a kerchief or something or a balaclava or something like that as a form of of respect or passivity much like waving like a surrender flag or or someone walking with their hands out to show that they don't have a weapon in their hand maybe that is something 
<laughs> oh man. Um I, I see you there, Wayne. Um Mike Gould says uh, uh enchantment becomes the go-to school. It's subtle. Evocation just brings the arcane police. Yep. And and uh and don't get caught using like illusions or something like that, because anybody that's using illusions is a deceiver. And if you're a deceiver, what are you what are you trying to get around? So yeah, I could see that. Yeah, yeah. You want to um now remember abjuration magic also protects the mind as well so you might have to be careful about that too <laughs> but but i'm i'm on the same page with you there uh wayne um wayne says careful now we might get a little too gruesome for the new watsy <laughs> cutting people's tongues out and breaking their fingers and stuff like that Ooh, oh i'm loving it i i i think that would be awesome um I know you guys have have and may still listen to um, hardcore history, and I like a comment. Uh, this goes back to old old episodes of of uh, hardcore history podcast, in which the uh, host mentions that World War One was so bloody and dangerous because, as he put it, countries learned how to take a punch. Like it was no more. There were no more wars where it was over within a couple days or a couple of weeks, right? Where one side or the other, yeah, I mean, yeah, me too. Um, it was he he was claiming that it was no longer one side knew they were overwhelmed by the other side, and he would just give up, and, and the wars were done. That with defensive magics, it makes people. I think conflicts become so stretched out over a long time that you end up having, it's not a matter of battering someone's defenses. It's starving them out, um, uh, cutting off their food and water supplies, um, keeping them from gathering the supplies that they need to leave their defensive, de defensive locations and whatnot that, yeah, you can hide behind defensive magics and prismatic spheres and walls of forces. But once you're behind it, where do you go? You know, yeah, you you have your Leoman's tiny hut, but if I if I spill chum all over your Leoman's tiny hut and you're surrounded by wave after wave of purple worms and and uh, land sharks and boulets and whatnot, what do you do? And I I love the idea of like <laughs> of of player characters like, damn it, we could hot, I've got these powerful magics, but if I use them, we defend ourselves. We might get stuck and 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 um and trapped. And I I love that. I love that. Yeah, Cam. Um. Cam brings up sabotage, siege, and assassination. I think would would definitely be there. And then, of course, you you have the black marketeers. Like, you know what? I know you're stuck behind your walls, but if you let your defenses down, I've I've got a treat for you. I've I've got what you need, but you need to trust me on this. And then people behind the walls are like, "Hell no! Oh no! We can survive about three more days before our water source goes out or something." You know, um, which brings up which of course brings up like divine magics and things like that. But eh, we can get into that, um, get into that later on. But yeah, I, I love it. Uh, Dante says an abjuration that's temporary and needs occasionally recharged um, would be a good way to give out insurance policies. Pay me for the month and your house can't be burned. Hells. Yes. Hells. Yes. <laughs> because uh, look, it's, of course, we, we we think of spells and magic and wizards, and maybe the wizards are the dominant force here. But if that power comes from other sources, whether it's arcane stones or someone knows the right ritual words to turn on and off these powers, or again, most spells have a duration. If there's a way to extend or reduce those durations or insurance policies back in the day, I don't know if you guys, uh, this is old, old school. Uh, and and a lot of this is still seen in Philadelphia where I was born and raised. Yes, I know the song. Um, police, uh, sorry, fire departments used to have these old fire helmets and there was a crest on the front of the fire helmet. And the fire departments where they would actually have to pull a cart behind them, sometimes pulled by horses, and they would have to physically pump the water out to put your house out. They didn't put out your burning house unless you paid to have this sigil put on your house that matched that fire department. And they, before fire departments became paid for by society, you had to personally pay a different fire department for different things. And it's pretty interesting. 
Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Wayne mentions this guy's prolific imagination would make a tough, scary, and extremely fun DM. Uh, that's don't don't blame me on that. It's you guys. <laughs> it's I'm just um, call me a muse. Uh, it's it's you guys that spark something in me. This makes me go like, oh my god, I can't believe you 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 said a thing, and you 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 know how it is, right? Somebody says something sarcastic, and it, it ignites something in me, and I'm like, actually, that sarcastic comment's actually kind of cool. I mean, imagine it's that real, and then it's like taking the real things and making fun of them. So that's that's what we do here. So I I, I love it. I love it. Um, all right, here we go. Okay, here's a long one. So I'm going to read it before I post it up here. So, um. I oh I know your I know your name and what it stands for, but I'm gonna call you um Ano <laughs> anyway. So Ano mentions that um that in terms of world building with magics of all types, one thing that is important to remember is that the spell options in a player's handbook are a small fraction of the magic in the world, notably those accessible to a relatively generalist PC. Consider what someone who is a pure abjuration specialist who knows basically nothing of the other schools could accomplish. Those are the kind of people at the high levels that could make a credible stab at making um, a mythological thing. I'm going to leave this comment up here because I had to read it because it won't, it, you know, of course the whole comment won't, won't be up. And I think that's another thing too. Like the player's handbook is the, is the off the shelf BS, right? Like, uh, you know, a magic missile. <laughs> Thank you there, Harry. I really appreciate that. A cup of coffee. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> very much. More, more than you think. Um, mythal. Oh, there you go. Hey, um, um, Anos. Mythal is an old school city sized shield in d and I did not know that. See, I learned something every day. But going back to your original comment, if I could leave this up here while I get back into chat. Um, going back to your original comment, um, I actually had a, a argument with someone when I talked about like, the you know, the tensors floating disc, the floating disc spell. And I was like, wow, it'd be kind of cool to put like, like heavy constructs on it, like tanks or something. And the person was like, well, the tensors floating, the floating disc spell only lifts up so much. And I'm like, yeah, cause that's the general spell. But like you said, a specialist would absolutely redefine redefine those spells and stretch and warp them through time and space. And I don't mean the universe. I'm talking like making them permanent, making them cover whole cities, making them far higher level than you would normally create, like a, a shield spell, but a shield spell that covers a whole army <laughs> when it's used or something like that. Like, oh, what is that, a meteor falling from the sky? Shield spell done, <laughs> you know, um, things like that. Uh, but any, uh, thank you, Kylie. <laughs> I appreciate that. Saying DBJ is a trove of knowledge and anecdotes and fun. He's humble, but yes, you're right. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much for that. I, I really appreciate that. And and Harry always showing up the on, the only person of a certain age older than yours truly. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Mm 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 mm. -mm. All right, I've got to go backwards a little bit in the chat, but that's quite all right. Uh, Dante says, Eberron was a really good setting for this type of stuff. I know their tallest city sold, sold single-use feather fall pins on street corners in case you fell from a spire. Yeah, um, yeah, I could, why wouldn't a city, why wouldn't a world like this, like uh, a band of 12 hunters has to go out into the wild, and before they go out, they reach over and grab like a, a medallion or put a put put a um a necklace on or a tiara or it's like a ring on or or they, they grab something that or they or maybe there's a person who enchants each one of them before they leave with some sorts of defensive like magics on their way out the door to bring them back, right? Like it might just be very common for for soldiers or something before they leave and they, they bless the gods or something. And then all of a sudden they go over and grab a rod and stick it into their belt. And that rod is able to have temporary uses, one, one shot uses of something defensive out there because the world's filled with, uh, with boules and purple worms or something that, that are everywhere, you know? And uh, I, so I, I like it a lot. And, and of course the game, like we're, we're talking um, about is like, 
what's available to the player characters is, is the off the shelf generalized Walmart M- Walmart version of magic, right? But the but the the unique magics, the magics that they find in the in a wizard's tower or something, are modifications of things like that. <laughs> oh, thanks, there, Wade. <laughs> Smash the like button, peoples. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Now, oops, here we go. Um, how am I going to pronounce here? I'm gonna call you. Um, all right, Bray. Bray, specializing in magic is a bit of a problem, mainly because in most traditional systems, the rules of magic are fairly limiting. And yeah, I mean, w- when you're designing a role-playing game, you're not designing society. You're designing something that player characters and game masters can engage in, right? And yes, once you start pulling on the thread of what's possible when you're designing a world, it, it gets a little bit ridiculous, I personally think it's fun. The ridiculousness of it is fun because now we have to think outside the box. Like, well, wait a minute. Like, if this if this becomes more ubiquitous where everyone has access to it, how does society operate? And I like answering those questions. Just, just personal world-building thought in my head rather than going, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? It's, it's the concept of if, if create food and water – or, or purify food and water existed, or good berries existed, commonly, wouldn't that change society? And my question, my answer to that is, of course it would. Yeah, of course it would. Uh, and, and by the way, thank you there, uh, Bray. I really appreciate you being here. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Vince is like, I mean, Rickard's like, uh, thank you for reminding me that I have the Book of Lost Spells. <laughs> yeah. Remember those? Yep. As, and as a matter of fact, in most of their, um, most games, they actually, uh, most, damn, my brain just went. Um, every iteration of Dungeons and Dragons mentions that Here's the common magic, but there's also uncommon magics that you can that player characters might have access to or develop their own spells as well. Yep, Wizards of Floating Cities. Uh, Mike Gould mentioned social standing. Says that social standing might be affected by whether you cast magic, good or ill. Going back to the Boule apocalypse, there may be floating cities available to a certain class or better. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, because. You know, are who who are you to be in our cities, right? Like um where he says, so unregulated sorcerers, for instance, live among the grounders versus wizards, you know, living in floating cities. And you know, there could be the, the reasons I believe like like Mike is bringing up about the difference between sorcerers and wizards is that a sorcerer is dangerous. If you're if you've got this well protected city, you don't want randos running around your your place like people that weren't brought into the x-men who at a moment's notice and puberty (laughs) start you know screaming out or something like that because of their first kiss and and exploding in a fireball right you don't want that happening in your city so yeah you're gonna have to get out you're gonna have to live on your own as as a grounder you know surviving by your own means right uh absolutely i i absolutely agree with you and that could well, what kind of tension would be there, right? Like a family member, the PCs are like, no, that's my brother or sister. You're going to kick them out the city? F you. And the wizard's like, pluck, <laughs> you're going to dispel, you know, or whatever, banish or something. And yeah. <laughs> Kylie's like, let me see if I can do the accent. Good berries again? Father, can you not ask for more coin? You work so hard and we would love the occasional hero's feast ever so. I'm just imagining like a <laughs> Oliver Twist. Food, glorious food. <laughs> oh, I I don't know. Father <laughs> wearing knickers and um and a uh, oh, what's the, what's the little hat? Not a derby. Oh. Oh, I can't remember those little hats with the the pants, the rolled up knickers, and the uh, and the suspenders and stuff. God, oh man! All right, so um, so Bray says less with with it doesn't make sense, and more how can I use it in a way that it wasn't intended for? One of my favorite characters to play was a battle mage with a sort of 
sort of card in my sleeve move in which I go invisible and right before big magic, oh, it won't do the whole thing. So, okay, right before big magic attack, I cast a reflection field right in front of the big bad boy's face so that he gets the full blast right to the face instead. Surprise attack bonus plus, um, surprise attack bonuses are nifty. Yeah, well, I love using, I love the idea of magic being used in the way that it's not intended. And um, defensive magic, as we were talking about, like, part of it is, like, yeah, it protects me from you, but it also means I, it also means I'm now behind something that I might not want to be. So I, I love it. Um, Mike Gould mentions, like, you could have, effectively, you have two settings, Urban Wizard Intrigue versus Mad Max Tremor Sorcerer Survival. Ooh, I'm loving that a lot. I, and you know what? That means... That also means that you're going to have to have a good blend of player characters or characters are going to have to be built with a blend of the two because on one hand, the Mad Max survival out in the wild characters are going to be the be the unsocial ones, right? They're the ones that are just like, the, they're, they're the Billy Badasses of the world surviving in this harsh world. But to go into the urban intrigue wizard places where they know at a moment's notice not only is are their powers less effective, but they could be cast out at any time that they know that they have to be more civil and uh, play the game, play the social game and uh, and dodge and weave the, the 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 verbal interactions amongst others. That'd be that'd be a really good blend of the two and and having to having to take care of the people who are more specialized in one area or the other, you know, keeping the barbarian from embarrassing themselves at dinner and protecting the, uh, the, the, um, the debutantes of the world uh, of, of all genders from the harsh realities of the Mad Max type world. So, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Um, hmm. So K.O. says, uh, says one of the highlights of playing a spellcaster is getting to the point where you can get a few signature spells that you designed. See, that doesn't happen as much as I think any any longer. But anyway, uh, when I run, uh, I like to give spellcasters a shot at making their own spell at 5th, 10th, 15th, and 20th. Um, let's them specialize into... Well, I can't see the rest of it with the way that the restream works. Uh, specialize into their concept even more and put their own mark on magic. And if it's good, I include it as a name spell in future campaigns. Um, matter of fact, if you really think about it, Tensor's Floating Disc, Morden Kanan's, uh, Tensor, Morden Kanan. Um, oh, what are some other named? Uh, um, um, uh, Leomond. Uh, anyway, you, you guys know all the named wizards that have their own classifications of spells. And one easy way, of course, to do that is you could take a spell and just flip it on its head, right? Like a fireball change fire to cold or a, um, a, a, anyway, changing a damage source, changing its uh, duration, changing its range. Um, instead of I cast stone skin on myself, I can cast a stone skin on someone else. Like these are different things. And of course we, you can easily, you can just narrate things the way you want. Like, does your stone skin look like crystal or something yeah well it looks like that fine uh thank you mike the auto tasha yep Otto's irresistible dance and all those kind of weird spells like that um tasha's uh there's a book named after tasha cu uh, currently but yeah big b um big b's hands spells um all those things are are absolutely i mean and really if you really go back in, in into the gaming history Many of them were characters played by the people who created Dungeons and Dragons in the first place, and they had spells named after their characters. So, yeah, why not? Hmm. Liam and Tensor. Yep, Morden Kane. Um, Cameron says, You think um, Basilisk would be brought in to create a building? To create building materials? <laughs> like, we don't need Greg anymore, but I sure need a, a coat rack. <laughs> Could you hold your hands out? Sure. And look over to your left. <laughs> Why? Nothing. Just 
Just hold, no, hands up a little bit higher. Spread your fingers because I, I need a place to hang my jewelry. <laughs> Oh, hilarious. I love it. I love it. Bringing in basilisks like, yep. Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I'll give you a comment in just a minute. Liam and Tensor, Morning Kanan, and all the rest were just high-level wizards from Gary Gygax's home games. And they made up spells and just put them in. I I love it. I, I love it. Uh, I absolutely love it. Yeah, Mike Gould says, ooh, petrification might be how imprisonment works. Yep. Uh, you... <laughs> Uh, a, a wizard is known by how many stone captives they have in their museum. <laughs> Tasha's uncontrollable laughter, is that the one? I know it's Otto's irresistible dance and Tasha's uncontrollable laughter. Thank you there, Wade. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, uh, Bray says, aren't basilisks those snakes with chicken wings that turn people to stone? No, those are the cockatrices. <laughs> the the uh, cockatrices are the chicken wings, and the basilisks are the um, are are the uh, lizards on a stick. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Let's see. Mike says a death sentence might be petrification followed by being pushed off a floating city. Ouch. Ow. Yeah. <laughs> Player characters arrive when they see, like, is that dust coming off that floating city? And when they get closer, they're like, nope, those are people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Mm -mm -mm. Yep. Bray mentions uh, the fact that in most cases, petrification is pretty permanent unless you want to do some shenanigans with soul transfer and necromancy. Yep. Which we'll, we'll go to other things. And... And, okay, um, okay, before we get out of here, um, imagine this. You want to go visit the nobles, the Council of Seven. I always bring up the Council of Seven because they, they're everywhere, right? So you go, the player characters go to visit the Council of Seven, and they're handed a small pin that they're supposed to put on their lapel. And they go, well, what, what's this for? They walk into the, 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 the king's chamber, and the king, sitting there, or in the council of other six members sitting around to talk to the player characters and walking around the room are nothing but pet basilisks, but no one's being turned to stone. And the player characters are like, what the hell's going on? And, and the council of seven little finger cir circling a little bit of like a, a gemstone or something. It's like, if you act wrong, what you're wearing is preventing you from being turned. It is anti petrification magics. The minute you do something wrong, we turn it off. So that could be, it's like the defensive magic allows you to avoid the thing until the people in control make it so that you aren't immune to the thing, right? Like, um, oh, for example, having a meeting in a room, in a lava-filled room filled with fire, you're immune to everything that's going on, but the minute you step out of line, Boom, we shut down the we cut the walls down and the flame and lava flows in or something like that. So that might be a thing. Yep. <clears throat> Arcane foci that are crystals might be shards of petrified ex-wizards. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I I love that. As a hey, maybe maybe you see their screaming souls in the in the shadows of the crystals as they're broken apart and used as coin. Uh Oh, uh, oh, uh. <laughs> yep, yeah, oh yeah, because Dante brought that up. Like, yeah, you you will pay the new taxes, or we shall stop the protection magic. Hell's yes. <laughs> City guards walking around with basilisks because they know everyone's protected from uh from petrification unless you haven't paid your taxes. And you knock on your door, and you're like, you're crossing yourself, like, please let please let me my taxes have be you know up the the par or something. And they're like, knock 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 knock. We need to speak to you. You're like cold in your eyes, like what what, what did I do? <laughs> I mean, that's just a, as an example. Um, Lastly, uh, Brace is going back to death sentences. You know what is a pretty gruesome punishment? Getting eaten alive by rats. Think about it. They can chew through bones. So while dogs or wolves just rip your throat, you'll stay alive far longer with rats. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. We've we've seen the the uh, 
strap a cage on someone's face and put a rat hungry rat in there or the the put a rat on someone's stomach and then heat heat the bucket up so that the rat tries to escape the fire by by escaping through your stomach or something yeah that's pretty nasty that's <laughs> pretty damn nasty and circling this back to our abjuration magics you could do something like that and that could be entertainment for people because you could be in a protective little bubble and people could actually watch watch a thing happen Yep. <laughs> a cockatrice fighting ring. Criminals are thrown in the pit. And guess what? Multiple criminals, one item that protects you from, from petrification. So now, now they have to fight over each other, and the cockatrice is, is released into the pit, and everyone's trying not to look at it while trying to go after the thing to grab the thing so that they don't get turned to stone. Ooh. I love it. I love it, guys. Okay. Um, got to get out of here. Got to get out of here. But thank you so much for, for stopping by. Um, by the way, please just uh, like, share, subscribe, punch the buttons or whatever. Click the clickety clicks, thumb the thumbity thumbs, follow along. Um, I, I would really appreciate it. Uh, and lastly, I, I don't know how much I can thank all of you for being the brilliant, funny, positive, engaging individuals um, that you are, especially as new people are coming in and guys who been, have been going from a long time and found me again and came back. You're always welcome to come back. Uh, I just really appreciate it. And uh, thank you there, Dead Man, for, for popping in levelup5e.com. It's I'm one of the contributing writers to this huge project from N-World. I, I guess I should talk about it a little bit more. So please go over there, check that out. The Kickstarter hasn't started yet, but they're literally – rewriting fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons as an advanced version of it. So, so yeah. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you there, Wayne. And, and Rickard's like, ooh, funny and positive. Who are you talking about? <laughs> Talk about you. <laughs> anyway, guys, I got to get out of here. Got to head off to work. But all of you have a great one. And thank you for, for essentially my creative morning coffee in the morning each day as as we in the States get up at uh, the crack of dawn. And Rickard, thank you so much, guys. Wayne and, and Rickard. <laughs> thank you, too. Oh, man. Peace. Everybody have a great one. See ya. <laughs>